Dr. Tom Venus is also a uh, professor of psychology at Campion College, so uh, you may also take a class from him in the future as well. Um, but take it away, Tom. Thank you. I'm just going to find um, a PowerPoint slide and share it. Okay, hopefully everybody can see this. So. Um, sorry. There, that's where I am. All right, thanks. Thank you all for, for attending the session. Um, so uh, the point of this session is to help you to improve your study skills as you make the transition from high school into university. Um, many of you uh, are, are probably uh, uh, very good students. You've done well in high school. Uh, last time I looked, something like the average uh, University of Regina student high school grade is something in the 80s. And so uh, you've had a track record of success. And uh, uh, you know, obviously you want that success to continue. But the reality is that, you know, as students transition from high school and university, uh, initially there tends to be a drop in, in, in uh, the grade average uh, for, for most students. And the average drop overall is about a full grade point. So an A student becomes a B student, a B student on average becomes a C student. Now these are, 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 are correlations. It's, uh, there are definitely individuals who buck that trend, C students who become A students and A students who become C students and that sort of thing. But overall, uh, students' performance tends to drop as they go from high school into university. Um, and I think a big part of it is a result of, of students not having effective study strategies. And so what I want to do today is, is tell you, you know, what science has to say about how you should best approach studying. So, so as uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, I'm a psychologist, but more specifically, I'm a cognitive psychologist. And so what I study is the human mind. And in particular, what I've, I focus in on is the human, is the human memory system. So um, I know how, at least as much as we know about how human memory works. And if you know something about how human memory works, then you, you have a few things you can say about how best to use that memory system to uh, best ensure your success as a student. So that's the angle that we're gonna be coming up with, uh, coming from today, is I'm gonna show you what this, the current science says uh, is the best method or methods to, to, to study. So that ultimately the goal is for you to uh, understand why it is that you succeed and also even more importantly, understand why it is that you fail on exams sometimes. Because uh, as I'm gonna say later on, um, you are most likely going to be in a situation where you're going to do not as well as you want on something or maybe a whole range of things, right? Be prepared for having some difficulties, but there are things you can do to minimize those difficulties or even overcome those difficulties by not, not because you're getting smarter per se, but because you're, you're, you're studying in a more effective way. So we will uh, get into uh, how we can study more effectively, and it's going to be based not just on my opinion, but on what the research, the scientific research has to say, okay? So the first thing I wanna uh, talk about is um, uh, the difference between the most common way of studying called rereading your notes and another study technique called retrieval practice. So rereading your notes uh, is, is, one, is probably the most common method for studying, not just for high school students, but for university students as well. And I'm going to propose that instead of doing that method of study, you should use what we call retrieval practice. Then I'm gonna talk about the difference between what we call mass practice and distributed practice. So mass practice is what it sounds like. It's when you study on mass just prior to an exam. So if you've got an exam on Monday and it's Friday, you'll start studying for it on Saturday and or Sunday and you'll study all day uh, and then and maybe all night and then you'll walk in and you'll write that exam. 
So that's mass practice. And, and uh, another technique is called distributed practice, where maybe you study even the equivalent number of hours, but instead of studying it in a single day, you're studying it over a two week period. And so there's two ways you can approach these things. And what I'm gonna argue is the better method is what we call distributed practice. And then I'm gonna talk about the importance of organization. Organization, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this when I get to that slide, but organization is not a nice thing to have. It's an absolutely essential thing to have. Uh, how you organize the amount of information will determine or have a big impact on whether you're gonna be successful at remembering that information when uh, when you're in a test situation. And then finally, uh, the, the last thing I'm gonna stress is the importance of making what you learn meaningful to you. So the goal isn't to become a parent and report back you know, all the answers as you're given questions. The goal is to understanding the, me the meaning of what it is that you're learning, right? And integrating it into your, your knowledge base. Right? So you need to make it meaningful and ultimately it pay, pays dividends. You're more likely to remember meaningful information, especially if it's relevant to you, than information that has no relevance at all to you, that's not meaningful to you. So that's, that's the outline of, of what I'm going to cover. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, something called the forgetting curve. So the forgetting curve was something that uh, we, we knew about, it was written about way back in, in 1885 by a researcher named Herman Ebenhaus, who was considered to be the, the founding father of memory research. So his research, again, the, the, he, wrote, he wrote a paper uh, uh, on memory, that was the title of it, on memory uh, in 1885, right? So this is a while ago, over a hundred, and well, I'm not gonna do the math, but over, over well over a hundred years ago. So um, uh, what he discovered uh, he discovered a number of important things. In fact, all the major principles of memory he discovered in that one single paper. Um, but one of the important things he discovered was something called the forgetting curve. And, and in essence, what it means is that if you give an individual something to remember uh, and then test them on it uh, shortly after or some point in time later on, that their, their rate of forgetting uh, is is shaped like uh, like a, kind of like a, a, a an inverted hockey stick. You do most of your forgetting early on, and then it tapers off. So what the, what he found was that within a relatively short period of time, like within a day, you can see up on this slide. If you take a look, you know uh, we've got on the on the x-axis axis, the elapsed uh, times uh, since learning, and you should take a look at at the units you have immediately versus 20 minutes, versus one hour, nine hours, one day, and then notice two days, six days, and then that last point is 31 days. And on the y-axis, you've got your retention recall, right? So obviously the higher the number, the better you're doing. And if you have a, uh, an individual who, let's say, learns what is required of them to learn to the point where they can recall everything perfectly, if you, re if you test them on that, uh, on their ability to recall that information, immediately after they managed to get everything perfect, they'll be perfect again, okay? So this that's where that first point uh, immediately, you'll see 100%. It's because they just learned that material to uh, 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 where they could recall 100% without any errors. And then you test them again and surprise, surprise, they do the same. They get 100% perfect. But if you take that same individual and you wait uh, 20 minutes, what you'll find is there's a precipitous drop in the in their performance, you go you go from 100 percent in this example down to 58 percent. Now the numbers vary depending on the type of material that you're using, but the the drop in uh, the amount of forgetting that happens over that short period of time does not change, uh, regardless of the material. You have a huge drop almost immediately after, just 20 minutes after. You're losing, uh, you know, four fifths of what you once knew perfectly. Uh, and if you wait a full day, right, you're still losing, you're losing about 70%, approximately 70% of the material that you knew. And here's the most insidious thing about this forgetting curve. You're doing, well, there's actually a couple of things. Number one, you're, for, you're doing most of your forgetting within the first, you know, first day, right? 70% of it will be dissipate within the first day. And then the, the other 30%, you will continue to forget it, but it'll be at a lower rate. Like you notice you've got one day you're at 33%. After two days, 
you're at 28%. After 31 days, you're at you know 21%. So you continue to forget things over time, but you don't forget the same rate. So all the forgetting is happening early on and especially immediately after. So that's the first thing that's pernicious about this curve. The second thing is that it's happening behind the scenes. It's happening when you're not aware of it, right? So you're not aware that you're losing all this information. Right, you could, and so here's an example that's a little bit co more concrete. You could be sitting in your favorite class, and the, the instructor is doing their job, and they've captured you, and you're paying attention, and you're learning, and they're explaining things well, and you fully understand that lecture. Right, let's assume that that's what the experience you've had. So, if I were to test you on what you had learned uh, uh, immediately after doing that 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 test, let's say you get all the questions answered correctly. So then you, you assume you know, the, you, you know the material. But what you don't realize is that when you're going for coffee and you're planning what you're going to be doing, you know, this coming weekend with your friends, that you're forgetting a tremendous amount of it, right? Within 20 minutes, about, you know, 40% uh, of the material has been forgotten. But you're not aware of that. Where you will become aware of it is when you suddenly have to take a test at some point later on. And then you're surprised at yourself when you can't retrieve it, when you can't retrieve an answer that you say, you'll, and Susan will say to me, well, I knew the answer, but I, for whatever reason, I couldn't do it. Well, it's, it's not because you're deficient in some way. It's not because you're not smart enough. It's because you have a human memory system and the human memory system is subject to something called the forgetting curve, which means you forget things, most of it, relatively shortly after you've learned that material. It's just a consequence of how your memory works. And so, as a student who wants to do well, you all have dreams. You're coming to university. Maybe you don't know exactly what you want to do, but you, you know you want to be successful here because it's going to open up pathways, right? If you want to be successful as a student, you need to confront this issue of the forgetting curve head on. You need to know how to overcome it. And that's why you study because you know you do forget. You just didn't know exactly how you forgot, but you know you do. So how are you going to overcome the forgetting curve? And really, that's what this talk's all about. How to confront head-on this forgetting curve so that it doesn't become a liability so that you can become what you want to become, even if you don't know exactly what you want to become right yet. So the most common way that students study for exams is rereading through their notes. So 80% of college students use this technique as their primary study strategy. Um, and there are three major problems with this approach. Um, number one, it's time consuming. So if you're a full-time student in university this coming fall, you'll be taking a minimum of three classes, but you could be taking as many as five classes, right, in the fall term. Each one of these classes, you're gonna be uh, 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 learning uh, an, a lot of information. Like just speaking for, let's say the introductory psychology, uh, I teach uh, Psych 102, or I have, I used to teach Psych 102, I haven't done it in a couple of years now, but uh, when I would teach Psych, 10, Psych 102, we would cover, uh, we'd have a textbook which would be about this thick, and hopefully you can see me, be about this thick, and we'd cover half of it. And you're responsible for everything that the professor says in a lecture, right? So that's a lot of material. And if you're trying to reread your notes, you're going to spend a lot of time just rereading your notes. Right, so it's incredibly time consuming. That's just for psychology. You'll have other classes as well. So it's really time consuming. The second problem with rereading your notes uh, is it doesn't result in durable memories. So right now I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as a scientist who knows something about the research on how you make memories stick. Uh, we call it consolidation. Rereading your notes does not produce durable memories, it does not produce consolidation. Um, so, it's, it, so what I'm saying is it doesn't work. The third thing that is, is problematic for this approach is, uh, and this might be the worst actually, um, is that it creates a feeling of familiarity, right? When you reread the notes, you think you know it because you just read it. And if I were to ask you questions about it immediately after reading it, you'll be able to answer it, right? So you think you know it. And then when you, it sets you up for failure because when you, you, um, uh, uh, write an exam, and then you can't remember it, you think it's because you're not good enough, because you worked so hard, right, at 
trying to remember this stuff. You studied for, people will say this all the time. I studied 20 hours. I studied 40 hours, 60 hours, throw a number in, right? They put a lot of time and effort and then they fail. What does that say about them, right? For them, it's an ego attack, right? They think it's because they're not good enough and it's got nothing to do with that. It's about their approach, right? They used a method that doesn't work. So I want to I want to prove my points. Okay, we're well, backing up with some research. So uh, there was a couple of researchers by the name of Calendar and McDaniel in 2009. So relatively recent, I guess maybe not for you, but for us, you know, if it's if it's after 2000, that's fairly recent. Um, but anyways, uh, what Calendar and McDaniel did was they would have participants in their study uh, read a particular passage, right, from Popular Mechanics. They would read a passage from that and then they would read the same passage again the very same one and then immediately give it they were given a test uh, another group uh, of different students and by the way these two groups of students were were equivalent in terms of their overall performance as students so then they had a second group of participants that would read the passage only once and then were given the test immediately after and what they found was that that the group of students that read the passage twice did a little bit better than the group that only read it once. Now, hopefully you're paying attention to what I'm saying uh, and you're saying to yourself, hey, that's opposite to what you just finished telling us. And it is, right? I told you that rereading your notes doesn't work. And this, uh, uh, this study that I'm talking about right now just shows that if you re read the notes twice, it's better than if you just reread it once. But I want you to focus on one thing that I said. If the test happens immediately after you read the passages, then you see this difference, okay? But there was another condition in the study. They had another condition with different groups of students, okay? Again, the students, the groups of students were equivalent in performance in terms of that, uh, whether they're A students, B students, etc. So again, the same thing happened. One group of participants would reread the passage once and then reread the same passage twice and then there'd be, the difference was, there would be a five minute break. And then they were given a test. That group's performance on the test was compared to this other group where they read the passage only once, have a five minute delay, and then were given the test. So condition two here that I'm describing was identical to condition one, right? Take a look, it's identical. The only difference was there was a five minute delay between the last time you read the passage and the test. And when you wait five minutes, what the researchers found was that there was no difference in performance between the two groups. So rereading the notes twice or the passage in this example twice did not increase performance, right? When you waited, when you had a five minute delay. And this is actually more like reality, right? When you are studying for an exam, right? You may reread your notes once, you may reread your notes twice and a whole bunch of other times in between, and then you'll have to go into the exam and the questions that you've been studying are not gonna show up immediately. So there's always gonna be a delay in a test condition. If you're not gonna be in a situation in real life where you're gonna be able to reread something a couple of times and then write the exam question, okay? So a better uh, strategy that you should do instead of rereading your notes is what we call retrieval practice. And again, what this means is exactly how it sounds. You, you retrieve things from your mind and you do it over and over again. You practice retrieving, right? So an example of this could be uh, flashcards or uh, creating questions, right? Uh, based upon your understanding of the, of the notes that you've got. Imagine you take uh, uh, notes in class and then based on that information, you come up with questions that get at answers that encapsulate the knowledge that you've learned from the class, right? So you create questions and then later you ask yourself those questions and see if you can retrieve the correct answer right so the difference here is, is profound what you're doing is retrieving stuff from memory or trying to okay so retrieval practice is ultimately the best way to study uh it has two benefits number one it tells you what you know and what you don't know so if you uh are if i ask you a particular question on something that was covered in class and you can't retrieve it, then you know you need to study it. Rereading your notes, right? You don't know what you know and what you don't know, right? It all feels familiar to you. 
But if I ask you a pointed question and you can't retrieve it, you know you don't know that. Or vice versa, if you can retrieve it, then you do you know that you know that. And that's something you don't have to study, at least right? not, not immediately, right? You have, there's other things you can spend your time on. Focus on things you don't know when you're studying, right? Versus the stuff that you already do know. The second benefit of memory retrieval, and again, this is backed up by science, it causes your brain to consolidate or reconsolidate these memories. So it makes the memories stick. This is the technique that makes changes in your brain, right? Learning, when we talk about learning from a psychological point of view, from a neuroscience point of view, really what we're talking about is brain change. You're trying to change the neural architecture in your brain to reflect this new knowledge. And so to produce a neural change, to produce learning, you need to do retrieval practice. That's how it happens. Not with rereading your notes, but with retrieving answers to questions, okay? So backing this up with some experiments, there was a, a really famous researcher by the name of Rodiger uh, and a bunch of his colleagues in 2011. They did an experiment where they had a number of different conditions. In the first condition, grade school students would hear a story that would name 60 concrete objects. And then they were tested on these 60 concrete objects immediately after hearing the story, okay? And what they found was that the students could recall 53% of the information. Not bad, right? A little, little over half of the 60, uh, 60 concrete objects they could recall. If they waited then one week after, performance declined down to 39%, right? So none of that should be too surprising. But they had another condition. In condition two, a different group of students heard that very same story uh, and had to name, uh, that ultimately named 60 concrete objects, and then they were given a test to recall those 60 concrete objects. But notice the difference here is they weren't tested immediately after hearing the story. They were tested one week later. So they didn't do retrieval practice for a week. And then they looked at performance. And the results were that the performance was 28%, right? So if we compare condition one over here, right, where we had uh, uh, after one week, 39%. Uh, in condition two, one week later, the performance was 28%. Now you might be thinking, well, that's 11%. What's the big deal? But that's a full grade. That's the difference between an A and a B. And I know you'd rather have an A than a B, right? It's That's significant for you. And the only difference was that the first group that did better took a test where they had to do retrieval practice. Remember, my point is, retrieval practice causes memory consolidation. Retrieval practice makes memories stick, okay? And, and that's what they demonstrated. In condition three, it's an elaboration. What they did is they had a different group of students, again, uh, who heard that same story with 60 concrete objects, but this time, instead of having uh, a test or no test directly after, they would have three small quizzes that would only test a, salt, a subset of the material uh, over the course of the next week, right? So they were given three quizzes after their initial uh, exposure. And then one week later, they were given the big test. So when given that test one week later, what they found was that performance was equivalent to the students that had the test uh, immediately after in that condition one, about 53%. Remember, we go back to condition one, performance immediately after was 53%. In condition three, if you tested people repeatedly throughout the week, and this is using retrieval practice, performance was just as good as people who had just learned or just read the passage and then were immediately tested, right? So retrieval practice makes memories stick, right? That's, that's, that's what they could, could, could conclude from their study. Uh, the same Rodiger and another graduate student, Carpickle at the time, um, did a paper in 2006. College students uh, studied pros on various scientific topics. They had two conditions. In the first condition, they were given an immediate recall test. And in condition, condition two, they reread the material. So this study is important because what it does is it contrasts those two techniques, right? Rereading your notes versus doing re retrieval practice. So they were given a test, both groups were given a test after a two day delay. And what they found was that the group that did the immediate recall test had 68% uh, on that test two days later. Uh, the people that reread the material didn't do retrieval practice, 
they got 54%. So this is a difference of 14%, right? So again, it, it, it may not seem initially at first not to be a huge difference, but it's this huge. This is the difference between somebody who gets into a professional program and somebody who doesn't, right? This is a substantial difference in performance. And again, everything was the same between both groups, except one was given retrieval practice as a, 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 a read after, and the other group reread the material. So again, uh, hopefully you're convinced that retrieval practice versus rereading your notes is the superior way to study for your exams, okay? The next thing I wanna talk about is the difference between masked versus distributed practice. So masked practice you know, uh, is based off of this idea that you practice until perfection, that you keep on doing it uh, until you get it perfect. You know, and if you watch, if you've ever seen a movie with a with a montage where somebody has to, you know, do really, really well, like a Karate Kid or something, they gotta fight the, the 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 evil person, and they're not particularly good, but they keep on practicing, and they practice day and day and day and day and day, hour and hour, and hour, hour after hour, and eventually they go and they 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 have their their fight, and then they win, right? Um, you know, it creates there's this type of storyline creates this myth of mass practice. That the way to attain success is to just do something single-mindedly, you know, dedicated, single-minded uh, practice until perfection is achieved. Um, this is false. Um, and so there's this phrase I heard I use all the time is uh, that, you know, uh, practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. That's the phrase. And what that means is it's the way you practice that makes something get better. And it's not mass practice, right? It's something different. It's going to be distributed practice. So, so here's, here's why, here's the, here's, here's the, the some results that talks about uh, mass practice. So um, if we take a look at this graph, this was, this is an old experiment that was done in, 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 in the fifties. Uh, uh, a famous re researcher by the name of Keppel did an experiment where what he did was he looked at the types of learning, types of, uh, of learning or practice that people were, were doing. One group of students were doing mass practice. The other group of students was doing what they call distributed practice. In the group that was doing mass practice, what he would do in his experiment, they, they all had to learn the same amount of material, right? All the conditions in, in, in this experiment had to learn the same amount of material. One group did mass practice. The other group did distributed practice. But within the mass practice group, some of them were tested after a one day delay and others in the mass practice group were given a one week delay. Students that did mass practice and then were given a one day delay did the best. So let's make it concrete. Imagine your exam is on Monday and you study all day Sunday and into the evening Sunday night. That's this group. And when they write their exam on Monday morning, success is obtained. Hurrah, great celebrations are happening. But notice what happens if you wait one week. They do mass practice on Sunday, but they don't write the exam on Monday. They write it a week later. Take a look uh, what happens in this letter code, it drops, right, from 5.9, remember, we're talking about mass practice, from 5.9 down to 2.1 performance. Huge drop in performance. So mass practice has its best impact when you have to be tested shortly after you studied. If you wait any period of time, you're going to forget a good chunk of that material. Now let's look at distributed practice. So this is his other set of bar graphs over here to the right, where we have it's called distributed practice. So these people would practice overall the same amount of time, but the practice wouldn't be in a single day. It would be spread over a number of days, okay? And within this distributed practice group, they would have a one day delay, that's the darker bar, and a one week delay, that's the lighter bar. And notice the one day delay performance is, you know, not quite as good as the mass practice, but it's pretty high. But what's interesting, take a look what happens when you have a one week, one week delay. Performance drops, it certainly does. But it's a small step compared to the chasm, 
right, with mass practice, right? Small step down of forgetting, so a small amount of forgetting versus a colossal amount of forgetting with mass practice when you have a delay. Now you're thinking right now, who cares? I'll go, I'm, I've got an exam, I'll, I'll study like crazy right before the exam, and then the next day I'll write the exam and I'll do great. And you're right. You you will. You're like all things being equal. You'll you you you're you're going to you're going to obtain uh, uh, some measure of success. But here's the problem. Uh, and I'll use my Psych 102 class as an example. In Psych 102, I would have two midterms followed by a final exam that make up the majority of the marks in the class. So there would be the first midterm, which would happen you know late September. And in that, uh, maybe early October, in that first exam, uh, we'd be covering stuff like the neuroscience aspects of psychology. And it can be quite technical. And so students are always worried about that first exam because there's a lot of material that we cover in that one month, one month and a bit. Uh, and it's very technical. So uh, students study like crazy for that exam. Right, but they usually do it the weekend before. They do mass practice, and then they write the exam, and they do relatively well. And I give them their results. So after I finish marking them, and there is much celebration, everybody's happy. They just finished writing one of the more difficult sections of the class, and they did well. This bodes well for their future. But notice they did mass practice. Midterm two comes along, and midterm two we're testing different material. We're testing the cognitive science of psychology. Again, can be fairly difficult, but it's not as technical sometimes as the first part. But they study hard. Well, they're, you know, they got a boost from doing well in the first one. They want to do well in the class. They study hard for the second exam and they do fairly well. And again, there's much celebration. And then we come to the final exam. And final exams in first year classes are comprehensive. And what that means is you will be given an exam and you need to know everything neuroscience, cognitive science, and everything else I talked about for that entire class. Hopefully now you're getting a sense of where the problem is. Because now when you're studying for that final exam, guess what? If you did mass practice, look at all the information you forgot, right? There's a delay. We, we covered neuroscience months ago. There's a huge delay between, you know, when you're writing that final exam and when you learned about neuroscience. And there's still a huge day delay between when you were talking about a lot of these cognitive science principles as well. So if you did mass practice, you forgot most of the material. But the smart students, and when I mean smart, I mean they studied better. They did distributed practice and look how much they forgot. Not much at all. Distributed practice makes the memory stick around longer. So when you have that short amount of time to study for the final exam and you did distributed practice, you don't have to relearn as much. And your performance shows on the final exam, right? You have, a, you have enough time to study for the exam. You haven't brought nearly as much material and you do well. The students who do mass practice, it's a bloodbath. Like the, the average plummets. And it's not just me in my class. This is, we talk, talk to other professors. They will tell you, marks plummet like a stone in the ocean on the final exam. Why? Not because the students aren't smart enough, it's because they didn't study well because they were using mass practice versus distributed practice where they're practicing uh, retrieval all throughout the semester, okay? So mass practice has a short-term benefit, but it has a long-term cost. And just, just to illustrate this, uh, we got three individuals, Leslie, Leanne, and Nora. Notice they all study the same amount of time. Nora studies four hours, and so does Leanne and Leslie. But Leslie, her practice is more distributed. Nora, her practice is all, you know, in one period of time. Overall, what we find, what the research shows clearly, is even with, if, with, with the same levels of ability, Leslie will, all things being equal, get the highest grade. And Nora will get the lowest grade overall. Right, and it's because, not because of ability again, it's about how they study for the exam, right? Distributed practice, this is what works. Another thing about distributed practice is you expose yourself to the material again and again and again. Now what this graph shows is forgetting curves, right? So just focus your attention on that, that reddish line, the orange, is it orange or red? I don't know, let's call it red. I think it's red. 
Uh, let's pretend that's the initial forgetting curve, okay? And so you do most of your forgetting early on and then it tapers off, right? You forget 70% of the material within the first day and then the last 30%, you continue to forget it, but it happens at a slower rate. Um, that's one exposure, one retreat, one attempt, one test after you've learned that material perfectly, you, do, you test them uh, once after that and you'll see this forgetting curve. But if you expose yourself to material again, and again, this is where you go look up number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. As you continually expose yourself through retrieval practice and distributed practice over time, what happens, take a look at the floor, right? The, 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 the end of the curve. What happens is that floor starts to rise up. It gets higher and higher. So that, yeah, you still go through the forgetting curve in the same way. You do most of your, your forgetting early on and then tapers off. But the where you plateau off, that performance level goes higher and higher. And if you expose yourself enough, then you will not forget anything, right? You'll, have, you'll, you'll enter a state where the knowledge is what we call crystallized. That means you don't forget anything. And this is the type of knowledge you want your lawyer to have when you're trying to defend yourself against a false charge. You want your lawyer to know law like you know, that it's to the point where it's crystallized, where they don't forget anything. If you're doing, if you're getting brain surgery done on you, you want your surgeon to have crystallized knowledge. And if you want to be a fantastic student in the class who excels, you want to have crystallized knowledge in the class the same way. And how do you do that? Through repetitive ex exposure to the material. Okay. So to follow this up, let's talk, let's focus on an experiment uh, from uh, student surgeons. So student surgeons, so as you all know, you know, it's very difficult to get into med school. You're a statistical outlier if you're successful uh, in getting into med school. Students who get into med school are outstanding students, right? They do very well in school. To get into surgical residency is even more competitive. So we're dealing with a student body. When you're talking about student uh, surgical residents, you're dealing with a student body that is of the elite, okay? These are all excellent learners, okay? So this one researcher had access to these surgical residents, 38 of them. And what they did was they had an experiment where um, they, they got access to a med school and the med school, you know, uh, 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 historically would have basically a single day of practice on something called microsurgery. That's where you attach small vesicles, small uh, vessels, uh, you know, together using, uh, you can see the picture here, right? Using uh, microscopes, uh, uh, vision enhancement devices, uh, and it's really, really finely detailed uh, movements that you've got to make. Uh, and it's quite, it's quite difficult. They would have, historically, they had single day practice where they had to take four short lessons in microsurgery. The researchers came in and said, could we try something different where instead of doing practice on a single day or uh, taking lessons on a single day, we could do it over a course of a week, right? Or sorry, uh, over the course of four weeks, one lesson per week. So it'd be over a four week period. And then compare performance on the ultimate test between these two groups. You see the difference, right? Mass practice versus distributed practice. And again, we're dealing with an elite group of students. What they found was that the students that were in the single day practice group, 16% of those students damaged vesicles uh, beyond repair. That uh, uh, was that meant they were kicked out of surgical residency. Okay, those so these outstanding students, sixteen percent of them didn't get to go on in their, in their surgical residency. Um, and this was stand, this is par for the course for them. And they scored lower on all measures as opposed to this other group where they dramatically outperformed the uh, that other group on all the measures, and not a single student damaged vessels beyond repair. They all got to go forward. Both groups had high quality students. The difference was how they practiced, mass versus distributed. Distributed is by far the better way to practice. Next thing I wanna talk about. So, so just, to, just to, to recap what we've talked about. If you have the choice between rereading the notes to retrieval practice, do retrieval practice. Don't do mass practice, do distributed practice. And the next thing I wanna talk about is the importance of organization. And as I said before to you, it's not nice to have, it's essential to have. So to illustrate this, there was a famous experiment that was done by Bauer uh, in, way back in 1963. So this is the dated experiment, but we keep using it because it's such an, 
powerful expression of, of the importance of, of organization. So what they did is uh, participants in this study had to learn 112 separate words, okay? Now these words could be uh, divided uh, into, there was a taxonomic system that these words belong to. So uh, they have, in their taxonomic system, they have at the top, they have minerals, and minerals could be broken down into metals and stones. Metals could be broken down into rare metals, common metals, alloys, and stones could be broken down into precious masonry stones. And then notice the words underneath, right? These 112 words they had to learn, right? One of them was platinum, right? Platinum is an example of a rare metal. Silver is another one of those concrete words they had to learn. Uh, and gold, right? So these are all just examples of the 112 words, but they fit within this taxonomic structure, right? Uh, precious stones, sapphire, emerald, diamond, ruby, right? Uh, alloys, bronze, steel, and brass, right? They all fit within this taxonomic system. So they had two groups of participants in their study where they had to learn 112 words, and then they'd have, to, they'd have four chances, four trials to learn those 112 words. But they had two groups of participants, one group had this taxonomic structure and the words placed appropriately underneath. And that was called the organized group. They could use this, this organizing structure to help them remember the words. The other group was what they called the random group, where those, they still had the same taxonomic structure, but the words were randomly dispersed below. Okay, so platinum might appear under precious stones and sapphire might appear under rare metals. It was all randomly dispersed. So you couldn't use that organizational system to help you with the retrieval of the words. And again, they had four attempts to try to remember all 112 words. So let's just take a look. If we've got the conditions, uh, uh, we have one, two, three, and four. These are the numbers of attempts. You have the two groups, organized versus random group. The organized group, the words were placed appropriately underneath. On their first trial, on average, people could remember 65% of those 112 words. On the second attempt, it went up to 95%. And by the third attempt, on average, they were getting, everybody was getting them all correct, 100%. Compare that to the random group that didn't have an organizational scheme to rely on. The first attempt is 18%. The second attempt is 35 And after, only after you get to the fourth attempt, do you approach what people were doing in, when they had an organizational scheme to rely on of 65%. It took them four times to approach the performance of what the organized group did on their very first. What's the difference? Organization. So I wanna have a, a, a do, do this you know, uh, in class to show you the power of this, okay? So you have a personal experience with this. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of, a bunch of words that I want you to be able to recall um, as best you can, okay? Now, before I show you these words, I wanna teach you a rhyme. And I want everyone to, to, to do this in their mind. And I'll ask for someone to, to volunteer to do the test later on. But before we get to that, before I show you the words, learn, everyone, try to learn this rhyme. The rhyme is, one is a bun, two is a shoe, three is a tree, four is a door, five is a beehive, six is sticks, seven is heaven, eight's a gate, Nine's a vine, and ten is a hen. So I'll repeat this one more time. One is a bun, two is a shoe, three is a tree, four is a door, five is a beehive, six is sticks, seven is heaven, eight is a gate, nine is a vine, and ten is a hen. Okay? So I'm gonna show you some words and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you some further instructions. So here's the first word, cup. So remember the rhyme, one is a bun. So I want you to visualize a bun and the new word you have to remember is the word cup. So connect those two concepts together, cup in a bun. Imagine uh, a red cup with a chip in it. And one is a bun, imagine a hot bun with butter that's melting on top of it. You can see the steam coming off it. And someone is placing that bun in that red cup with a chip in it. It's a red porcelain cup, right? Imagine that in your head and not just imagine the images, but imagine the motion, right? The motion of the butter that's melting and the steam coming off, right? Imagine that red cup and you know, that bun being placed in it, 
right? Put that in your head, right? It's very visual. One is a bun, the word is cup. Two is a shoe. The word you need to remember is flag. So I want you to imagine a Nike shoe with a Nike swipe. Maybe it's a blue shoe with a Nike swipe. And the word is flag. So imagine a flag. Let's make it a Canadian flag. And it's rolled up like a snake. And it's rolling around. It's, it's, it's winding itself around that Nike shoe, that blue Nike shoe. Try to Im imagine the motion. Imagine the images of the, the shoe and the Canadian flag. Okay? The next one is three is a tree. So envision a big oak tree. The word you need to remember is horse. So imagine this beautiful, huge old oak tree. And underneath it, there's a, a horse. Let's say it's, it's, a, it's a white horse with brown spots all over it. And it's a beautiful horse. And it's cold out when it's breathing. You can see the, 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 the uh, evaporating, or sorry, you can see that the air, uh, the con condensation of the air from the, the horse as it's is, as it's breathing, and maybe it's neighing, and the horse is prancing around, and right, a dynamic image, right, of this tree that's swaying in the wind, and a horse with uh, a spotted brown horse that's white is uh, 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 prancing uh, below it and breathing, and and the air uh, air is condensing around it as it breathes. Next word. Uh, the, so the next one is, so we have one is a bun, two is a shoe, three is a tree, four is a door. So imagine, the word you have to remember is dollar. So imagine an American dollar bill. And someone taking that American dollar bill and hammering it onto a wooden door. Four is a door. The word you got to remember is dollar. Okay? And it's an American dollar being hammered into the door. Five is a beehive. Imagine the, 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 uh, a brush, okay? Brush is the word you have to remember. Imagine taking a brush and, in, and envision this in your mind's eye, somebody take, having a brush and slamming it inside the beehive and all the bees coming out and then you hear some screaming and yelling, right? Five is a uh, beehive, the word is brush. Someone slams that brush into a beehive, bees come out and you start hearing screaming. Six is sticks. So the word you have to remember is pan. So imagine a pan on top of sticks that are on fire and you're cooking eggs and you can hear the sizzling of the eggs. It's a cast iron pan. It's a black cast iron pan. Okay. Six is sticks. The sticks are on fire. You're cooking eggs in this black cast iron pan. The word to remember is pan. Seven is heaven. Uh, so imagine heaven. Uh, let's, let's, let's make it with clouds. Okay. And a bright sun. Um, and angels flying around, and the word is clock. So in the middle of these, uh, of maybe uh, a bunch of these clouds, you've got this big grandfather clock, and it's golden, and it's chiming away, okay? So seven is heaven, the word is clock. Eight is a gate, the word you got to remember is pen. So imagine a bunch of big pens, right, that make up the slots of the gate, and they're different colors, right? There's blue, there's black, there's red, there's green, Right, and they make up the slots. It's a strange, it's a strange, uh, 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 strange gate, but that there it is. Nine is a vine. The word you have to remember is paper. So uh, maybe you've got a bunch of crepe paper that makes that sound, that crepey, that crinkly sound, right? The paper and the paper. Nine is a vine. Maybe the vine is made up of the paper. It's a paper vine with different colors, right? Uh, blues and greens and whatever. And they and when the wind blows by, the crepe paper makes sounds, crinkling sounds. And then the last one, 10 is a hen. So imagine a hen wearing a red shirt, a t-shirt that says Campion College on it, right? And the hen is really happy to be wearing a shirt because it's cold out. Uh, 10 is a hen and it's wearing a red Campion shirt, okay? Envision that in your mind. now. So we've just gone through this, this rhyme. One is a bun, two is a shoe, three is a tree, four is a door, five is a beehive, six is a stick, seven is seven, eight is a gate, nine is a vine, and ten is a hen. Can I have someone volunteer to uh, tell me what those uh, words were that I showed you?
Anyone? I can try. Sure. Okay. How about how about how about we try this way? Uh, your name is Brooke. Yep. Hi, Brooke. Um, so I'll, I'll help you out a bit. One is a bun. What's the first word? Cup. Two is a shoe. Flag. Three is a tree. Horse. Four is a door. Dollar. Five is a beehive. Brush. Six is sticks. Pan. Seven is heaven. Clock. Eight's a gate. Pen. Nine's a vine. Paper. Ten is a hen. Shirt. Good job. You got all, you got all of them right. Now, if I went and I'd asked students who weren't shown this rhyme, there would be the odd one or two that would get all of them right. All right. So, but let's try something different, Brooke. Let's do it in reverse order. Uh, uh, ten, uh, ten is a hen. What's the word? Shirt. Nine is a vine. Paper. Eight's a gate. Pen. Seven is heaven. Clock. Six is sticks. Pen. Four, uh, 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 five is a beehive. Brush. Four is a door. Dollar. Three is a tree. Horse. Two is a shoe. Flag. One is a bun. Cup. Six is sticks. Pan. What's the eighth word? Pen. What's the fifth word? Brush. What's the uh, third word? Horse. Thank you for making my point so excellently. <laughs> <laughs> so if we had asked other students to do this who didn't have that rhyme, they wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, if I didn't tell you about this rhyme and Brooke, you went up and you suddenly showed your memory skills, you know what people would think? What do you think people would think, Brooke? That I have an eidetic memory. <laughs> yeah, thanks, good word. <laughs> uh, you should take my memory class. Uh, yeah, they think that your memory, that you have, you know, another way to phrase it, you have superhuman memory and you don't. Well, I'm sure you do, but that's not what you need to have you know, uh, uh, this type of performance. What you need is organization, right? That what you just did is something called the pegwork technique. And then it's an example of a mnemonic device and it works, right? Obviously. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. I want to, um, hopefully you, you, again, you, you made my, you made my point about organization. The last thing I want to talk about is how you want to make the material that you're learning meaningful to you. Okay. Um, so to illustrate this, I want to talk about uh, a theory called levels of processing theory that was developed by two research, uh, researchers, Craig and Lockhart. Um, and so their theory was this, that deeper levels of, of mental processing result in longer lasting memory codes. So that, you know, if I give you a concept in class to remember, you don't just try to remember the words, you try to understand what it means and hopefully what it means to you. And if you do that, you're going to, that type of thinking will result in longer, laster, longer lasting memory uh, codes or memories uh, that you have in your mind. And so according to the theory, they said that you can process information or you can think about information in a shallow way or in a, a deep way, okay? So shallow way, it's when you focus in on the physical features of a word, right? Is the word written in capital letters, right? To answer that question, you don't, know, you don't have to know anything about the meaning of a word. You just have to know, is it in all caps or not? Okay. But to answer the question, how would this word fit in the following sentence? He met a blank on the street. To answer that question, you have to know something about the meaning of the word that you're processing. That's an example of deep processing. So again, what Craig and Lockhart were arguing is that if you want to remember something better, process it in a deep way, in a meaningful way. Okay, and so uh, Hyde and Jenkins, they did an experiment to demonstrate this. They had participants that would have to analyze a list of words by counting the letters or the number of E's, so that's shallow, or rating the pleasant, pleasantness of the word, that's deep, right? How pleasant is the word? When I, when I say the word uh, door, how pleasant is that to you? Versus if I say uh, dog, how pleasant is that to you, right? To answer that, you have to know something about a door, you have to know something about a dog, okay? 
So they had one group of participants that were asked a, a bunch of questions about these words, sometimes deep questions, sometimes shallow questions. And then they had another group of participants that were given a surprise recall test. Oh, sorry, sorry, let me back up. Uh, the, the group of, of individuals who were asked questions about the words, shallow or deep, they were given a surprise recall test. They didn't know they were going to be tested on it. They simply thought they had to answer questions about the words. There was another group that were told, here are a bunch of words, remember them because you're going to be tested on them later. And they were. So an example of this, you had one group, they were told, simply look at the words and then answer the following questions. So they see the word spider and then have to say, how many letters does that have? Right? Notice that is a, a, a shallow processing. You're not asking anything about the meaning. Desk, how many E's does desk have? Right? Again, not processing anything about the meaning. You don't need to answer that question. Right? Just looking at the physical characteristics. That's shallow processing. In contrast, uh, you, might be, you might also be shown the word book, and then you'd be asked, how pleasant is this word for you? To answer that question, you've got to go deep. And then they were given a test. We call the words that were presented. Now, this was a surprise because they didn't know they were going to be given a test. The second group, it was much easier. They're told, look at these words, spider, desk, and book. Remember them because you're going to be tested on them later. And then they were given a test. I want to, I want to show you the results. So these first three bars that you see here, right? Uh, counting the number of letters, counting the number of E's, right? The pleasant of the, uh, pleasantness of the words. This was that condition one group. This is the group that was given a surprise test. They didn't know they were going to be given a test. And look at the performance. When they were asked questions that make, made them focus on shallow, the shallow things, right? The physical features of the word, performance was worse. When they focused in on the deep processing, asking questions about meaning, performance improved a lot. Take a look at the group that was told, sorry, Sarah. Oh, uh, we just need to wrap up and move on to the next session pretty quick here. Okay, sorry, I'll finish this off. If you take a look at the inst uh, instructed to memorize uh, group, that group was not surprised. And their performance was just as good uh, as that rate pleasantness. And the point I wanna make here is that this group here that rated the pleasantness, did, were, they weren't expecting a test and yet they did just as well. And what this shows is it's not about your intentions, it's about how you process things that determines your, your performance. So to wrap up, retrieval practice is uh, how you're gonna do better with distributed practice, organization is essential, make it meaningful. All right, that's, that's where we're all at. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Tom. We really appreciate you being with us today. You're welcome. Uh,